Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from our website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 12 in our series for 2024, and today's date is Friday, April the 19th. First, I'll be talking to Justin Sesson, CEO and co-founder of The Dom, Australia's newest online retail outlet. Justin is particularly poised to speak about how more young Aussies are turning to outlet shopping to reduce both landfill waste and price points. And I'll be talking to EY economist Cheryl Murphy about Australia's latest inflation figures. But first, let's talk to Justin Sesson. Well, Justin... Tell us about the Dom and uh, outlets. Yeah, so the Dom is a, an online fashion outlet. Uh, we think it's uh, quite unique, especially in the Australian marketplace. And and the reason why we came into this business or came up with this concept is being in fashion and retail for a long time. I just saw an opportunity for a more elevated and more premium outlet, specifically one online and one that really understands the needs of the brands, the sellers, uh, the product who's the product of who we are selling and also the customer. And we know that they customer is always looking for a discount and a big percentage of consumer sales are made at a discounted rate. Uh, and there are discount propositions online, whether it's a uh, yeah, catch or or eBay or some of the bricks and mortar offerings, for example, at the DFO Centre. But our opinion is that a lot of them are cluttered down market and it's not the experience that the customer or the brand wants. So that's why we came into the DOM. And there certainly is a movement globally with uh, more elevated discount propositions. If you look at the outnet or if you look at uh, shop premium outlets in the in the States, there is a big movement to that more aspirational premium outlet proposition, which is the gap that we hope for the, well, we believe that the DOM is filling in Australia. Well, all the outlets uh, I see are sort of just selling sort of very cheap wholesale stuff, but, but they are very cluttered. Yes. Extremely cluttered. Yeah. And, and I think the perception that you've got is that it is cheap down market product, but in many, in many instances, it's not. I think it's just the environment that you find them in. When you, when you go into an outlet mall and you've got tens of products stacked in a rack or as many as you can fit into the shelf, uh, that's what creates that perception of that product being old and that product being uh, not aspirational. But that's that's absolutely what we are trying to change, trying to change that perception of outlet and help educate the customer that it is a place where you can find good quality on fashion product. So how, how does that work? How, how, do you, how do you actually create that non-cluttered look? Uh, it's the, well, multiple things. It's the way we present products on site. I think there's certainly a curatorial lens that we apply. We don't just put any brand and any product on the site. So we are handpicking the brands that we think uh, fit the criteria for for what we're trying to present to the customer. So that will be the first part. Uh, the second part is how we actually present that on site. So it's not about screaming sale and big red banners and uh, and clearance final clearance. It's that's not what it's about. Now, and then the third part is how do we actually create that story and help inform the customer? So like you would if you go into a full price store or a full price website and there is storytelling and there's uh, information that's uh, important to their customer and how, how to outfit, how to how to dress and how to wear the latest trends and that type of lens, if we can apply that to discount product as well, it's all the same. So how do you do that? How do you actually do that uh, net narrative for the customer? Well, it would be a lot of, content on site and content through our communication channels, whether it's email or social and, and helping inform the customer of what it is, whether it's what brands or what trends or, or what items they should be buying, what are the staples and, and educating the customer. So the DOM is basically online. Is that right? It's all online. Yep. So, so take, walk me through that. Walk me through that communication channels of how you do that. Yeah, so it'll be on-site. So I think the on-site experience, uh, which we'll be updating in the next couple of weeks with the with the new front end, but that on-site experience it is, is the editorial component is key. So again, it's not just throwing all the products that we could find at the customer. It's how do we merchandise? How do we provide the customer with the product that's relevant for them? And whether that's through typical search and merch or whether that's through, as I said, that uh, that editorial lens and, and creating edits that help the customer understand or, or give the customer some guidance as to what they should be buying. Uh, you would have to actually really know who the customers are in that case, wouldn't you? 
Yeah, I mean, personalization is a part of that, of course, but there are some more generic ed editorials that we can create. And another thing that we've got on our site is a concept that we call precincts, uh, and precincts do support with that. So what the precincts are, um, so similar to you go into a Cheston shopping centre and you have all the luxury brands together and the sports brands together, they're, they're precincts within the shopping centre. We're creating this concept or replicating that concept online, which does help us talk to a customer in a language that's familiar to them. So without actually understanding who that specific customer is, if they're finding their way to the designer precinct, we, we, more, we roughly know what language we should be talking to them. And how much research goes into something like that? Uh, it's more our experience in understanding the market, understanding uh, who the brands are in the market and, and which brands we think appeal to which customer. Now, what sort of brands are you offering? So we've, we've got a right, wide range, anything from Adidas to Superdry to designer brands like St. Agni and Lee Matthews. Uh, we've got some homeware brands. So our goal is to be that fashion and lifestyle destination. So we've got 250 plus brands on the site at the moment. Uh, and that's obviously uh, growing pretty quickly too. So how long have you been going for? We've been trading for just over a year now. Yeah. And the, and the ide ideation was, was really in the beginning of COVID. So let's say... May 2020 is when we started to come up with the idea and really build out on it. Okay, so so you base this very much on what was what you saw overseas. But firstly, we base this on the opportunity that we saw in the market. Myself and all the partners and all the people involved, we come from retail and we come from fashion, and it was really just thrashing out the well, what is the opportunity that exists exists in the market. And if if you want the background of how we came to the idea is beginning of COVID, we're thinking, okay, well, everybody's going to have a lot of stock to clear. Where are they going to clear that stock? We looked at the channels that were available to brands at that point in time. And our opinion is they are down market, they are cluttered, and yes, they do exist, but what does it look like on the other end after the brands go and clear their products in these environments for 10, 20 cents in the dollar? We don't think that that gives much to the brand as far as uh, integrity goes. And also for the customer, it's not an aspirational, it's not, a, it's not a brand rewarding experience. So that's the opportunity that we saw in market to change that perception or change that opportunity for the for both the brand and for the customer and then obviously with our research we we looked at what is happening overseas and you know, spent a lot of time looking at businesses like the outnet which is uh, owned by netta porter uh, otrium based out of uh, the netherlands uh, shop premium outlets in the states and there certainly is a big shift towards that because brands need the proposition to sell the discount product but they also understand that it needs to be an environment that is that is positive for their brand and not brand damaging well that's interesting because uh, there's been a lot of difficulties in that retail space here which is like 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 catch for example yeah have been struggling yeah and i can't comment on the catch business but i can say that there that we absolutely identified an opportunity out of out of what the catch doing particularly in the fashion space because i might don't want to talk about another business but sure but my, I mean, my opinion is there is a space, particularly for fashion, there, there is the right environment to sell that product. Uh, is a business like Catch or, or eBay the right environment to sell fashion? My opinion is no. I mean, I think those are great businesses for other products, but it's, it's not an aspirational environment that's uh, suitable for an aspirational product. Uh, and that's where we think the opportunity exists in the DOM. Right. So, so what's the demographic of the DOM customer? So it's a Gen Z millennial. So, I mean, anywhere ranging from 15 up to 40, 45 plus, but it is a fairly wide audience. And I think yeah, our, our product range certainly talks to that wide audience. We've got anything from Adidas to you know, designer brands like Lee Matthews, but our precinct approach is what helps us talk a talk the right language to the right customer. And so your customers obviously knows their way around the website and everything like that. Yeah, and there's an educational process, of course. I think the... The, the, this precinct concept is fairly new. It's not overly complicated, but there is an educational piece required to help the customer understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So they know exactly where to go to. Yeah, and, and, and that that's yeah, that's the process that we need to educate them on. How challenging is it to do that education? It's it's not too challenging because it's not a foreign concept because it's something that they're familiar with in a bricks and mortar shopping center. So it's really just taking that thought process and applying it online. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's as simple as that, is it? Yeah, yes. And, uh, so, and, and the customers take to this quite well at the moment? 
Yeah, we, we think so because what it does is it helps remove all the, the clutter, which is the big word that we're trying to remove, uh, of the products or the brands that aren't relevant to them out of the equation. So we're giving them a, a more focused, curated view of the product that's relevant to them. And obviously right. with things like personalization, we can further enhance that. But at a base level, without understanding anything about the customer, we can at the very least present products and brands that should be relevant to them. And then over time, we can hyper curate that through personalization. Well, Justin, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thank you, Leon. And now let's talk to EY economist, Sherelle Murphy. Well, Sherelle, uh, our latest inflation figures was uh, 3.4%. What's your view of it? Look, it's only a good number, Leon, in the sense that it's obviously coming much closer to the Reserve Bank's three to, sorry, <laughs> 2 to 3% target band. But I think because it's not the quarterly number, we have to be just a little bit careful in how we interpret it because, you know, clearly it is not capturing the whole picture of inflation, which the Reserve Bank is concerned about. You know, there's certainly some good news in there, but there's also still a lot of bad news. Um, you know, the core inflation number was a bit higher. Uh, we've also seen some service prices be continue to be very high. And these are the, the, the prices, I guess, that reflect the strength of the domestic economy and the strength of, the, the, I guess, the purchasing power in the economy that the Reserve Bank is trying to calm down. So I'd suggest, look, on the surface, it's looking good, but I don't think we're out of the woods yet in terms of, of getting inflation to where it needs to be. Well, my interpretation of the figures was the inflation figures kind of went sideways because mm. because you yeah. had, well, holidays and accommodation was up mm -hmm. and rents were up as well, mm -hmm. as was Indeed. education. Yep. Insurance, and, very insurance. Well high. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those services were high. I mean, that, that's something to be quite concerned about. It certainly is. And, you know, some of those are you know, not easy to fix either. You know, the rental problem, of course, is not something that's going to go away in the short term, given we have a, a deficiency in supply relative to demand. It's possible there was a little bit of a Taylor Swift effect. These numbers were for February. And when we looked at the, uh, the spending on hotels and accommodation, for example, you know, it is likely that the, 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 the Sydney and Melbourne numbers were slightly higher than normal. But look, it would be very minor, to be honest. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, it's it's part of the story. Right, okay. And the other big concern is uh, what's happening with inflation in the US. Yes, um, yes, certainly the US uh, economy is moving along, you know, still at quite a strong rate. And, of course, the inflation number is moving in the wrong direction. I would note, though, that there are some pretty big differences between what's going on there and what's going on here in the sense that that is an economy with a very loose fiscal position at the moment. Whereas here in Australia, we, we're almost sitting on a, a budget, well, we are sitting on a small budget surplus and that may even continue again into the next year. But, you know, these, are, these I guess, background issues are not irrelevant, I think, in the inflation context at the moment um, with that economy in the US obviously being driven uh, by really quite a loose fiscal position at the moment. It certainly tells us that inflation is quite sticky and difficult to manage well absolutely and you know we do have to take some lessons from that because some of the drivers of their inflation are international factors that we'd also be subject to and the other thing of course is we need to keep in mind that as we move forward there may be new sources of inflation that are not even in the numbers yet so you know the shipping situation comes to mind here it's not a big factor right now but could it become one yes it could Indeed. And uh, I mean, I know a lot of economists are predicting a rate cut in, uh, well, June, I heard, of, from one, uh, or mm -hmm. September. But the issue, I would think, is that we have tax cuts coming in in July. And mm -hmm. they're evenly spread. And I think you're going to see a lot of people, well, I hope they're going to use those tax cuts uh, to... Um, put into their savings because the cost of living crisis. But mm. uh, you're more likely to see a lot of people rushing out to, I don't know, Bunnings, Chemist Warehouse and uh, <laughs> um, uh, JB Hi-Fi, and that will drive up inflation. That's right. Or perhaps booking another holiday, since we all seem to be very holiday uh, or excited by holidays at the moment. Uh, look, I think the, 
yes, the tax cuts will certainly help the consumption numbers from the point of view of obviously that they, you know, they boost income and disposable income anyway, and they uh, will feed through. But we have to also keep in mind that our disposable income has been eaten away by higher taxes now for much of the last two years. And in fact, tax as a share of disposable income is at a record high uh, at the moment. So it's really, there's been this kind of quiet bracket creep in the background, which means that we're all paying more tax. And so these tax cuts only give us back some of that. But, you know, we can't ignore the fact that relative to the status quo, they certainly add a little bit more money back in people's pockets and that could at the margin be inflationary. But look, I mean, I've been sceptical about the view that the Reserve Bank would be willing to cut interest rates this year for some time. And, you know, when we look at what's going on in the economy, the strength of the labour market, the strength of the housing market, the fact that we've got these service prices, as you say, continuing to be high rents are high uh it's it's to me it's adding up to a situation where the reserve bank would not want to fuel or risk fueling any further inflation or inflation indeed not getting down into its target band soon enough Um, and the tax cuts obviously are a factor that supports that argument I mean, even if the quarterly numbers come down the question is how sustainable is the drop in inflation. I mean, that sustainability is a quite key issue, isn't it? Well, that's right. We can't assume that inflation is on a one-way track. You know, it doesn't sort of just linearly fall having been high. And the Reserve Bank has spent quite a lot of time talking about some of the risks to inflation and the fact that to get inflation down from 4 to 3%, is a lot harder than getting it down from seven to four, which actually occurred reasonably quickly and reasonably neatly. So as we go through this kind of tail of the of the bad inflation, if you like, then I, I, yes, I think there's many reasons to suspect that it's going to be a bit of a rough ride, um, at least over the next sort of six months on this on this front. Uh, well, Michelle Bullock has been quite hawkish on it, and she says the problem with inflation in Australia's uh, – oh, this was at first press conference – she said the problem with inflation in Australia's got a four in front of it. Mm. And it, so it has to come down quite substantially, down to the 2 to 3% range. And even if it – it will take some time to even come down quite low to, say, 3.1% or 3.2%. Yeah, and that one of the factors for the Reserve Bank to consider, of course, is inflationary expectations, because the longer – inflation sits above the 3% mark, the less likely people are to believe that the Reserve Bank has control of inflation. And so then they start to adjust their expectations of what inflation will be in the future. And of course, that can be a self-fulfilling prophecy because it starts getting fed into businesses' input for uh, forecast prices, into wage negotiations, um, and into pricing going forward so it it certainly is dangerous if it hangs around above the target band for too long which is one reason why the reserve bank would be very reluctant to give any guidance on what it's planning would that be right absolutely and they 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 must maintain that kind of vague (laughs) uh, prediction so that they basically just so they can't be proven wrong because if they're proven wrong, then they lose credibility. And the number one thing that a central bank has is credibility. So they must maintain a, a degree of vagueness in their in their future uh, expectations of what they're going to do. And also, to be fair to them, they don't know what they're going to do yet either, because they have the luxury of being able to make a decision month to month, or at the moment, six weeks to six weeks as they watch the data come in and make decisions on the day, us economists who are trying to think about what the, the, the cash rate will be in sort of 6, 12, 24 months' time, well, we're making predictions on data that we obviously haven't seen. So it is a bit of a harder job from that point of view. So you would expect a rate cut probably in 2025? Yeah, somewhere in the 2025 camp. I, I, at this stage, I think it's 2024 is too soon. That puts me well and truly outside the market's <laughs> predictions but uh, unfortunately for mortgage holders i feel like the data is falling my way at the moment so maybe february or february maybe... yes okay yeah okay well we'll wait and see well yeah. well thank you very much sherelle 
Thank you. My pleasure, Leon. Thank you for having me on again. So what's happening in the news? Well, the International Monetary Fund has slightly upgraded global economic forecast, but warned about progress on inflation on the back of conflicts in the Middle East and Europe. Global growth 2024 is expected to rise by 3.2% in the April World Economic Outlook, 0.1 percentage points higher than the previous update in January. While low by historical standards, the global growth forecast for 2024 has been revised by 0.3 percentage points since October 2023. IMF Chief Economist Pierre Oliver Gurinchas said most indicators point to a soft landing, but stalled progress towards inflation targets are among risk factors with stubbornly high services inflation. Other risk factors include possibility of further trade restrictions on Chinese exports, rising oil prices, but the possibility of the conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza spreading into the wider region, creating further commodity price spikes, along with attacks in the Red Sea and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Bring inflation back to target should remain the priority, Mr Gurunchas said. While inflation trends are encouraging, we are not there yet. Other downside risks to the outlook include China's troubled property sector, which could lead to ongoing economic weakness and pain for trading partners such as Australia. The IMF expects the Chinese economy to slow from 5.2% in 2023, 4.6% in 2024, and 4.1% in 2025. Yet the financial institution views the risks to the global outlook as broadly balanced, with upside possibility including inflation falling faster than expected as jobs market participation keeps growing, allowing central banks to start cutting interest rates sooner. Economic predictions for Australia are little change from the previous update, with the IMF forecasting a 1.5% rise in GDP in 2024 and 2% in 2025. The nation's economy is expected to expand 1.4% in 2024 and 2.1% in 2025. The IMF forecasts Australia's inflation be at 3.5% in 2024 and back to 3% the top of the Reserve Bank of Australia's target rate by 2025. And Tesla is slashing headcount by more than 10%, part of a global retrenchment extending all the way into its executive rank as a car maker struggles with slowing demand for electric vehicles. Chief Executive Officer Elon Musk revealed the job cuts in an email to staff, citing duplication of roles and the need to reduce costs. If the dismissals apply company-wide, they would amount to more than 14,000 employees. Tesla reported vehicle deliveries early this month that missed expectations by a wide margin, posting its first quarterly decline in four years. Several analysts are bracing for the EV maker's sales to potentially shrink for the year, citing slow output of its newest model, the Cybertruck, and a lull in new products until the company starts producing a next-generation vehicle late next year. As we prepare the company for our next phase of growth, it is extremely important to look at every aspect of the company for cost reductions and increasing productivity, Musk wrote in the memo. As part of this effort, we have done a thorough review of the organisation and make the difficult decision to reduce our headcount by more than 10% globally. There is nothing I hate more, but it must be done. In its most recent workforce reduction, Tesla cut about 10% of salaried workers in mid-2022. The EV slowdown Tesla has felt of late has been widespread. China's BYD delivered just over 300,000 battery electric vehicles in the first quarter, down 43% from the final three months of last year, when it briefly pulled ahead as the world top EV seller. Manufacturers including Volkswagen AG, General Motors and Ford have delayed, dialed back or altogether scrapped EV projects as consumers balk at still high prices and a lack of charging station. An outgoing Woolworths boss, Brad Banducci, was threatened with six months in jail for contempt of the Senate after he refused to directly answer questions about a profit metric in a fiery Senate hearing that went off the rails on Tuesday. Mr Banducci declined to confirm if the supermarket giant's return on equity was 26%, twice that of the big banks, but similar to miners, saying it was not the best way to measure the profits of supermarkets. The retailers, like the big miners, argued that other metrics, such as return on capital, are a better indicator of how profit the businesses. He said the supermarket's chain focus was on was return on investment, the return for each dollar put into the business, which was a common corporate finance measure. Mr Banducci said the nation's largest grocery chain made a 10% return on investment, in line with the average for the Australian share market. Green Senator Nick McKim said a first-year commerce student could calculate Bullworth's return on equity, accusing Bullworth's making off like bandits and threaten the CEO with contempt and a prison term for not answering questions more directly. Mr Banducci said he would take the question on notice after a lengthy the confrontation when he confirmed he didn't know the number. Mr Banducci, who hands over to Amanda Bardwell in September, said he disagreed with Senator McKim, citing competition from discount chain Aldi, pharmacy retailer Chemist Warehouse, West Partners backed Bunnings and US 
giant Amazon. I would respectfully submit that this is an incredibly competitive market and that is good for consumers, he told the Greens led inquiry. Coles boss Leo Wecker, appearing after Mr Banducci, came out quickly revealing that the company made just over $1 billion net profit last financial year and achieved 31% return on equity. Coles had a 15% return on capital last year, noting the metric is used for executive remuneration. Senator McKim also sparred with former Labor Minister Dr Craig Emerson over his disclosure and connections with big business. Dr Emerson, who the government tasked with probing the conduct governing supermarket relationships with their suppliers, has opposed a Greens-led push to threaten the big retailers with breakup if they abuse their market power. Senator McKim took issue with Dr Emerson being employed by West Farmers in 2015, with the, which at the time owned Coles, and with a don disclosure of his more recent roles with the Business Council, where he advises on immigration policy. Opposition Treasury spokesman Angus Taylor accused the Greens of political grandstanding and said the focus of the Greens should be on getting prices down for consumers and fair deals for suppliers. Liberal Senator Dean Smith, who is participating in the inquiry, also slammed the Greens. The Australian public has genuine questions over why they're paying more at the checkout, but the Greens and Senator McKim seem more interested in grandstanding, he said. Instead of wasting the public's time and Senate resources, they should be putting their energy into what we can do to fix Labor's cost of living crisis. And leading defamation lawyers and academics say Bruce Lehrman's spectacular defamation defeat will make high profile litigants think twice before rushing to court to redeem their reputation. But in a case described as an omni-shamble by the federal court's Justice Michael Lee, Mr Lehrman was effectively found to be a rapist and a liar and may face a crushing costs order arising from his legal gamble. Verdict is the second within a year to chip away at Australia's reputation as the world's defamation capital after Ben Robert Smith emerged from his own libel claim tarred as a war criminal and murderer. Speaking outside the federal court on Monday, Ten solicitor Justin Quill, a partner at Thompson Gear, said the ruling served as clear warning to potential plaintiffs who might want to try and reinvent history or make a quick buck. Filings in the federal court heard forum for defamation claims have fallen. At the same time, a number of high-profile litigants have suffered losses and had embarrassing and damaging claims against them erred in open court. According to statistics published in Australian Defamation Law and Practice, the number of defamation trials in Australia dropped from a peak of 31 in 2021, 20 last year, following the introduction of a new serious harm test and public interest defence. The new laws have not been adopted in Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Defamation lawyer and Gaydon's partner, Marina Olsen, said the Lemon case was the latest in a series of spectacular own goal by defamation litigants such as Craig McLaughlin and Ben Robert Smith, whose compulsion to seek vindication can occasionally backfire spectacularly. It is another example of public figures who find themselves in the press for all the wrong reasons, thinking wrongly that going to court to get a defamation judgment will be a good idea, she said. As Justice Lee noted in his judgment, Mr Lehrman has not been convicted of a crime, but through his own civil claim has now been found to have engaged in a great wrong by raping Brittany Higgins in a Parliament House office in 2019. Having escaped the lion's den, Mr Lehrman made the mistake of going back for his hat, Justice Lee said. Justice Lee said the former political staffer would have only been entitled to $20,000 in damages, only a fraction of the legal fees accumulated in the trial. Peter Bartlett, former chairman of Minter Ellison, said he expected litigants to think twice before seeking reputational rehabilitation in open court after the Lehrman saga. It's very easy to issue proceedings for defamation, but it's like grabbing a tiger by the tail. Easy to grab a hold of at first, but hard to let go without being bitten, he said. Those thinking of suing for defamation should recognise that you cannot anticipate what evidence will come out in trial. Often, damaging material raised in court can receive far more publicity than the original publication. Sydney University media law professor David Roll said that while the Robert Smith and Lehman trials were atypical cases, the results would give pause to public figures contemplating defamation action. The number of high-profile defamation cases would like to continue to fall in the next few years, he said, as plaintiffs assessed the financial costs and legal effect of new uniform laws. And Star Entertainment's chairman and former chief executive privately schemed to wage war on the casino regulator and considered engaging shareholders in a class action against the New South Wales appointed government manager. Nick Weeks, special manager of Star Sydney, alleged to an inquiry called by the Independent Casino Commission in New South Wales that the ASX-listed gaming group was also bulk-approving high-risk customers when it was meant to check the source of their wealth and even falsifying documentation about welfare checks. Emails and text messages tended to the inquiry between Robbie Cook, who quit as chief executive last month, and David Foster, the group's chairman, showed that star executives knew about Mr Week's schedule 
and investigated who he was meeting. The inquiries being led by Adam Bell, SC, and was called by the state's casino regulator in February. It is concerned Starr has not done enough to overhaul the company's culture. In one exchange in January, Mr Foster suggested the company try to remove Mr Weeks from a position. If done right, it could be a catalyst to get rid of Weeks, Mr Foster wrote in a message read by counsel assisting the inquiry, Casper Cond. Mr Foster also proposed a different option to Mr Cook. Another angle is establishing grounds, if possible, for a class action from shareholders against Weeks and or the NICC. Mr Wicks, who controls Star Sydney's licence, was installed at the casino in October 2022 after the first inquiry. On Monday, he said he was surprised by the emails and messages sent by Mr Cook and Mr Foster because he believed he had a strong working relationship with the board and executive. Star is one of two major casino operators in the country alongside Crown Resorts, which was sold by billionaire businessman James Packer to Blackstone after similarly damning findings against the company in 2021. Star is backed by a number of wealthy investors including publican Bruce Matheson, who's taken a big position this year. Mr Bell's first report in 2022 found Star was unsuitable to hold its licence, describing its operations as a case study of unethical conduct and cultural failure that may have evaded taxes and facilitated $900 million of banned gambling transactions. Over four months, his inquiry reveals Star hid criminal gangling junket operator Sun City's illegal cash cage and allowed it to operate a simple secret gambling room. The hearing on Monday began to shed light on newer failings of the Sydney operation, including what was described by Mr Weeks as a deliberate falsification of records. Mr Weeks was referring to an ongoing investigation that has found star staff members are not interacting with patrons who gambled on a slot machine for at least three hours, despite records claiming they had done so. And millions of workers could soon have the right to double their annual leave by taking it at half pay as part of a new entitlement under consideration by the workplace umpire. The Australian Council of Trade Unions and Employer Group are close to consensus on introducing the right into industry wards to give staff and firms greater flexibility to allow for paid time off. However, both sides are still apart on safeguards, with employers pushing for full discretion to refuse staff requests and unions arguing for refusals to be based on a reasonable criteria. Australian Council of Trade Union Secretary Sally McManus said taking twice the leave that's half pay could give workers more time and flexibility to manage their caring responsibilities and balance work and care. While the Fair Work Act contemplates allowing workers to take annual leave at half pay, few awards actually permitted. During the pandemic, the Commission introduced temporary rights for employees to take leave at half pay as a way to avoid them taking unpaid leave while sick, but the entitlements have since expired. Unions and employers are understood to have agreed that the right to request should rest with the employee rather than the employer. However, Australian Industry Group Chief Executive Innes Willocks said it was critical such arrangements were by agreement given bosses could struggle to accommodate longer staff absences. Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Workplace Relations Director Jess Tinsley said the amendment was common sense change. However, she warned that giving workers a unilateral right to double their leave whenever they like could have enormous ramifications on an employer, especially during a busy period or where they are short staffed. The entitlement to take leave at half pay is different from policies on purchasing normally, where employers allow workers to spread any pay reduction across a year in return for extra time off. Fair Work Commission is considering award changes to better suit work and care responsibilities, including the right to request work from home and expanding ordinary hours beyond 9 to 5 for remote workers. And major Australian media companies reeling from the prospect of losing $300 million in advertising revenue from a government crackdown on gambling advertising now face an even more expensive blow from a possible ban on junk food ads. The groups representing the multi-billion dollar television industry and Australia's biggest advertisers have slammed an early study that explored banning or significantly limiting unhealthy food promotion as lacking evidence and unfairly targeting marketing over other factors. Quick service restaurants alone chains like McDonald's and KFC spent $382 million on advertising in 2023, industry data shows. Last year, the Albanese government funded a feasibility study by academics from the University of Wollongong on ways to restrict junk food advertising and packaging. Teal MPs had pushed the move for months. The study's suggestions included government intervention to reduce fast food ads, restricting ads on TV between set times such as 5.30am and 11pm, or limiting unhealthy food marketing through online media. Australian children's dietary habits are suboptimal, the report's authors note. One priority strategy is to reduce children's exposure to unhealthy food marketing, branding and sponsorships. Unhealthy foods covers more than fast food. It is defined as foods and drinks high in fat, salt and or sugar 
and are not needed as part of a healthy diet. Last month, the Australian Medical Association called for restrictions across all advertising, especially online, and the construction industry is dominating tap payment defaults, Creditor Watch says, as the number of Australian companies are going into external administration hits a record high, with more than 1,200 companies collapsing in March. That figure, 1,208 for the month, is 22.6% higher than the same month last year. Creditor Watch says, with the chances of an interest rate cut in the near future looking increasingly remote, this pressure on struggling businesses is expected to remain high. The credit analysis firms, which releases its business risk index on Wednesday, said hospitality businesses were at the greatest risk of failure, with a 7.44% probability of collapsing in the next 12 months. It said the stubbornly high inflation figure in the US means that the likelihood of cash rate cuts in Australia in 2024 is now looking remote, and that this will have serious implications for the business community, considering that as recently as last month, there was strong expectation of at least one cut to the cash rate in 2024. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to Tim Gaspar, Director of Hatch Financial Services. Tim has worked for 15 years as a mortgage broker, and he knows exactly what's going on in the market. And I'll talk to Indeed Economist Callum Pickering about Australia's latest unemployment figures. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. If you like Talking Business, please leave us a review with Apple Podcasts. Thank you in advance. In the meantime, you catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. If you want to contact me, email me at leon at leongetler.com. I answer all emails. Wishing you all a safe and healthy week and looking forward to bringing Talking Business next week.